Hey, this is Knut. Howard has taken a few weeks off to go climb some mountains on his bike, so we'll be doing reruns of some of our favorite panic pods. This is the first of two episodes with Jason Hirschhorn, which was aired back in March of 21. Enjoy. Welcome to Panic with Friends and your host, Howard Lindzen. Hey, Howie. Very good. You're getting good. Well, thank you. Thank you. Do we have a guest today? Yes, we do. We have a great guest. All right. Do you want to know his name? No. I'm no? going to wing it and just show you how good an interviewer I am. <laughs> okay. Good luck with that. Let's do it. You just dial this person up and I'm just going to wow you. No, I know who it is because we've been blowing him off and he's been blowing us off and... It's not Obama. Don't get too excited. But if he couldn't get Obama, would this guy excite you? Second? Oh, he would excite me. Um, Obama and him, I I wouldn't probably compare them too much, but, you know, (laughs) do you have 19 more questions? Well, he was president of MySpace. All right. So he might be a little older than you, but he might not. No, I don't think so. And I think he was early MTV president, I believe, too. So we're going to sling box. This guy has seen things and been around media for a long, long time. And I am such a closet fan and media geek. And he interviews people all the time. And we kind of follow each other on Twitter. And I finally got him to uh, come hang out and talk media with me. And so I'm just going to wing it and let him riff on some subjects in 2021 that are exciting to him. What's bothering him? What gets him excited? Because he's a master People think I'm a curator of like finance, and I am. I fancy myself someone who just tries to read as much as possible and share some good ideas, and that's what I get from Jason Hirschhorn. Mm-hmm. Oh, I just said his name. Uh-huh. Who's in in Los Angeles, and I think loves New York as well. But he has been inside the beast. I mean, MTV and MySpace. Wow, that's impressive. You heard of those? <laughs> yeah. What was the equivalent of MySpace in Norway? Was there, was it MinSpace? How do you say MySpace in Norwegian? MySpace in Norwegian would be uh, Mitt Omrode. Exactly. Yeah. This is why Norwegians don't have internet companies. Yeah, there's no... You can't spell the names. No, exactly. It's impossible. So let's get Jason on the phone, but he is, is a master curator at Redef. Let's get him on the phone. Sounds good. I Jason. hope this is my DoorDash guy. Is this my DoorDash guy? Because I'm starving. <laughs> listen i've checked your rating on doordash low tipper <laughs> listen the worst thing they ever did was show me the routes that those drivers take it just gets me crazy but uh good to hear from you howard good to hear from you uh you've taken COVID seriously but you're okay i am okay um i took it seriously because i've got you know some stuff like diabetes and i also respect my fellow man so i've worn my masks and done my quarantine and i i finished all of netflix and pretty much tried every restaurant in los angeles and my son did say that to me he goes dad can i get a hulu subscription because uh, netflix is out of stuff is that possible to run out of stuff I think I'm unique in that. No, it's not possible to run out of stuff. Um, but I will, I will tell you, and it's going to be the first piece I write for Redef in April, but I watched over 350 shows and films, documentaries since last February. And I, when I say shows, I mean every episode within the show, not 350 episodes. Yeah. So I, I pretty uh-huh. much, you know, I pretty much invented the new, the newfound uh, couch potato. And uh, I have indents in my ass from watching so much streaming video. (laughs) And I'm so excited to do this conversation because we don't have to talk about anything except media. So I got to just try and rein this in. I will get to your favorite topics, but what was the coolest job you have? Was it, was it MTV or MySpace? I mean, honestly, it really, uh, the coolest job I ever had was the first startup or or two of them. I'll I'll say the first startup that I had was, was called mischief new media which I started while I was in college designing websites for record labels and, and sort of media properties, but it morphed into me building out my own music network akin to launch, which Dave Goldberg started years ago, or um, some of the early sites like UBL that Mark Geiger and Rick Rubin had started. Um, 
and selling that to MTV. So that was just my first time doing something on my own. It was super exciting, but ultimately the greatest thrill was working with my best friend, Blake Krikorian at Slingbox. And largely because I'm a New Yorker, I'm a scrapper. I like unfair fights. And we had this device that let you, you know, sort of stream your cable box back to your computer and phone. And the cable industry wanted to kill us and the content industry wanted to kill us. And I love David and Goliath fights, certainly when David is the good guy and we won. And that was probably the most fun I ever had in my career. Now, he was loved. I don't know about you. I like you. I don't know if I love you. He was loved. Loved. And he passed away? Yeah, Blake passed away uh, a couple of years ago and uh, was a shock to all of us. You know, one of the true mensches in technology, a a pure creative genius from, you know, solutions um, around video and media and has a long history in that business as a consultant and work with a lot of famous people. But with Slingbox, it was very simple. Him and his brother wanted to watch a baseball game and they couldn't in their house because of some blackout rule. And they created this device called the Slingbox and it attached to your cable box and then basically gave you a virtual remote and your DVR and everything, you know, streamed to your computer. And Blake, you know, as you know, had this smile and had this way of convincing people. I used to compare him to Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible 1 when they say they're going to break into the CIA. And he would just say, I would say, Blake, you're nuts. We can't do this. He goes, oh, we're going to do it. And I, uh, I met him once he, in Vegas and he was just so charming. Yeah. You know, every year we go to CES together and, and get yeah. a suite and Blake, I'll tell you a great story. So we get a two bedroom suite and we would be like the hangout room for all our friends like Jim Lanzone and Mike Marquez and, and, and others. And one night I was out for a meeting and I came back at around eight o'clock. The door was open to the main suite. All these guys were playing rock band, which he hooked up. Blake used to take the TVs down in the suite and hook them up the way he wanted to and put all his electronics <laughs> on there. And he somehow was trying to coax Tony Bennett, who was walking out of the elevator into the room to do rock band with us. And that oh my God. was really his spirit, which is he was this technical and creative genius. He had the greatest personality in the world and was just fun. And I miss him every day, as do a lot of people. But uh, that that really learning on how to fight unfair battles because you believe in it. And you know, there are a couple of times in your career you see something like an iPod or a TiVo or a sling box and you just get it. And, you know, he created one of those things and went against the monsters and ultimately sold to them and won. And in many ways, he, he sort of invented the anywhere, anytime video experience and doesn't get enough credit for it. Wow. Our world's really, even though we don't know each other, well, our world's really collide. So Mike Mark has one of my, one of my most favorite people, trusted sources, put the first bucks in my pocket with him and Quincy Smith bought Wall Strip. Mike's on my yep. board at my new SPAC and Jim Lenzone's fucking great guy. So was Clicker kind of, was Clicker to work with Swingbox or was Clicker because that lucky bastard got bought by CBS? You know, was it was, I, th- I think we, you know, I don't come from the Valley. So I was a little more of like the media tech outsider, but you know, it was a small world where Quincy and I had met when I was at Viacom. Quincy's and Mike run an advisory and bank called Code Advisors. And when I was at Viacom sort of trying to innovate um, and push them into streaming media, Quincy was at Allen and company pitching companies. And as I decided to leave Viacom, he was deciding to leave Allen and company. And he ultimately went to work for CBS running their digital division. And it was Quincy who came to me after meeting me, meeting Blake and tried to convince me to go to Slingbox and leave, you know, MTV after I had signed a, you know, multi-year deal. And you know, uh, and then I, that's how I met Mike Marquez, his partner, who also moved over to CBS. And then Lanzone was a friend of all of theirs, uh, including Xander Lurie, who now runs SurveyMonkey. Um, a lot of these connections came from Blake. A lot of these connections came from Dave Goldberg and, you know, um, sort of the what would Goldie do crowd that we, we all, you know, sort of leaned on Dave um, for advice and love. And it's nice to see all these guys, you know, end up being successful. And Clicker was sort of that amazing guide to video on the internet and had a couple of iterations. And that was sort of the time that I had met Jim Lanzone, who now runs Tinder, I believe. Yeah. He's CEO of Tinder. He was, he stayed CEO of, of CBS Interactive forever. He's just such a great guy. Yeah. I have so many and, and, stories you know, that I can't share because he was so nice to me. And, you know, built out a streaming business in, in CBS All Access with his team at a time where, you know, Viacom and CBS were not an innovative hub. 
So, you know, it's, it's very nice to see, and I'm sure you've seen this in your career and a lot of your listeners where, you know, you all start out with ambition. You're sort of in the same lane, but you're not. And you keep in touch and you help where you can and you come and talk at their company and vice versa. Or they suggest you for something. And all those guys are really a great group of people who really did help each other. And it's nice to see them successful, not just monetarily, but they built stuff that matters. And uh, I'm sure you're the same way, but I try to give that stuff back. You know, I wouldn't have had a chance if there weren't people like those helping me. And when I see a young entrepreneur, you know, it's not always about asking about stock or being an advisor for money. It's really about that's a great idea. What can I do to introduce you around and help you? Yeah, you and you and I have the same kind of jujitsu there. Like I just got lucky I would cold call Fred Wilson or send him whack job comments when I was a hedge fund guy. I was like, why are you giving away this stuff for free on your blog? And then he mentored me. And that's how I, he's the one that got Marquez and Quincy interested in Wall Strip. Quincy called me up. What the hell? I'm like doing a web show in Phoenix. Next thing you know, I'm in CBS BlackRock getting acquired by CBS, like li literally Larry David style. And then Marquez was looking out for me. Then I meet Lanzone. He sells clicker to CBS. So everybody did well. Yeah, and but but I think one of the points I like to make about those relationships is it wasn't from a a point of self interest. I remember running into I think I ran into Fred Wilson on a plane back from the Bahamas once, and I had never met him, but I read all his stuff, and I and he knew of my newsletters that I was doing on the side, and I just was asking him questions on the plane. Fred didn't try to go after me for investment. He didn't ask for a piece of stock. He gave me suggestion, and I don't think we see enough of that now. We live in this world now where everyone reads LinkedIn. And, you know, there's seven ways to do something and 10 ways to do this. And everyone sees advisory boards and everyone's given stock. And then they post how much money they made. And at the end of the day, all of us started from nowhere. All of us started in a place where we didn't know a lot of people. And I don't have enough fingers and toes to count how many people who helped me by just giving me advice. And I think it's an important thing for people to remember, which is it's not about just your self-interest. Like give, you know, well, I'll call them kids, but give kids a hand. Um, and, you know, also let them know that there's no one way to do anything. But you were at the beginning of that because MTV influenced so, I will come back to Slingbox because Knut's got to be yep. slathering. Knut's the geekiest guy I know. How cool Slingbox. Did you ever have a Slingbox, Knut? No, I never did actually, but I heard great things about it. I mean, is that totally thing, up your alley? Yeah. That's the stuff that Knut yeah. goes, why doesn't that exist? You would have wired your house like that to save 50 bucks a month for sure. <laughs> the, the funny thing about Slingbox, um, the real funny thing, and I'll, I'll tie it back to my beginnings at MTV, which is I was the one in my family who always you know, got the new gadgets and the new toys first, and I would tell them about it. And my sister was getting married, and she was marrying someone uh, you know, who was from Cyprus and London and all these different places and was a huge soccer fan. And this was at a time in the U.S. where soccer was the biggest sport being played, but not anywhere really existent on television. And he had left the sling box back in London so he could watch his Manchester United games. And he showed me this thing. And I was blown away because I was traveling. I think at MTV, I ran, I ran digital all over the world. So we were in 117 countries, you know, all different websites and mobile products. And I would come home on a Friday night and I'd look at my DVR because I'm a television fanatic. And this was the golden age of HBO and, and all these things, you know, all these new shows being on. And I, I was, I was like, Oh my God, I'm not going out for a couple of days. And my brother-in-law said, no, there's this thing called Slingbox where you could watch something, you know, in your own time off your own DVR from anywhere in the world. And I remember talking to our corp dev people at Viacom and saying, this guy, John Semmel. And I said, you got to find this guy. And love John Semmel. What a great guy he was. John Semmel, one of the great corp dev people with zero inner monologue whatsoever. And he's like, actually, I just met with Blake and Blake uh, and this was around October of November. I forget of one year. I met Blake in uh, January at CES. He showed me a demo of watching his home television off his trio, you know, the phone. And I'll never forget it. Um, and I had just signed this five year deal with Viacom. And within seven months, um, I had left Viacom to become president at Slingbox. And it's, it's largely because I loved that product and because I love Blake. And the way I had gotten to MTV was, I grew up in the 80s. Um, MTV launched around 1980, 81. It was, you know, a truly a, a different experience that we'd ever seen before. That's where you learned about new music. It's where you learned about new pop culture. It was what I call a trend magnifier. Um, they would find, you know, small pockets of culture and fashion and sports and music and other things and then magnify it to the world. 
And when I built out this music network in my spare time after web designing and Sony had approached me about buying it, they had a, a unit called 550 Digital and they had approached me about buying it. I went to attorneys and they said, well, we need to shop this around. Who would you like to work for? And I have this really weird background where when I was a kid, my grandparents gave me five shares of Warner Communications and the CEO was a guy named Steve Ross. So the yeah. way I got into the media business was I would get these, these quarterly magazines from the five shares that I owned. And my heroes started to be Steve Ross or Bob Pittman or Tom Freston at MTV or Judy McGrath. And when I started to watch those channels, I always wanted to work there. And when they asked me where I wanted to be, if I could sell my company to anywhere, I said, I would love to sell my company to MTV owned by Viacom because Tom Freston and Judy McGrath are my heroes. And literally one year later, after the, the first offer from Sony, I had closed the deal. I think it was March 5th, 2000. I joined MTV uh, and their site called SonicNet. And that's really how I got to MTV and what I call my college years of business, where I spent six years there building up their digital unit. How old are you? Are you 90? Um, I went to school with Moses. He was a classmate of mine. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, am, I, I am 49 years old. Only 49. Oh my I started God, you're younger young. than me, you prick. Yeah, I, I was, uh, you know, a shut in at the keyboard watching The Sopranos while I was coding uh, my HTML sites. That's as far as I went. And, uh, you know, knew very early on I wanted to be in the music business. But then, you know, as Napster came around, my detour was into sort of the digital side of things. And, uh, and MTV is where I wanted to be. And I wanted to learn how to run a company. And one of the funny stories, Bob Backish, who is one of the guys that bought my company for Viacom, he now runs Viacom. I remember I came into work the first day. I'd never worked anywhere before. So I started my company right out of college. And he, he worked in, he goes, I think you're going to be great. I think you're going to have a long career. Maybe one day you'll run this place. But I just got to tell you, Jason, you can't wear sweatpants to work. And um, <laughs> no, he was wrong. Was, Lulu. Yeah. Long term, he was wrong, certainly. But, you know, we're talking a multi-billion dollar corporation we're walking into. And uh, I would say that I probably I, and I think they love me for it, to be honest with you. Like, I think Freston got a kick out of the fact that I just did not give a fuck. And there is a sort of, you know, I, I wouldn't say arrogance, but there's a sort of license that when you put some money in your pocket, but you still want to work gives you where you really go for it. You don't play it safe because you want to innovate. And, you know, I used to tell Tom, like, even though we were a television company that that's not the future and that the future are these sites and these mobile products. And when I'm done, you know, when I'm done building that for him, I want his job. And I think they got such a kick out of that. And a little of that was the fact that I really, you know, became a, a business adult when I worked at Viacom for the first time, everything else was about just building toys in my, in my apartment and then selling it to Viacom. Where'd you grow up? What city? Uh, New York city, um, born and bred, uh, 56th and between first and Sutton. Wow. And where'd you go to college? Um, I went to college my first year at Boston university. I went to sort of like the, the, the school in Boston university that you're either going to juvie the military, or you get to go to sort of this remedial, you know, one year before you get into real college. And then I left there. I took a year off. I was, I was a club promoter for many years successful since I was like 15 and did some of that stuff in Los Angeles. And my parents were like, get some reality. And I went to NYU undergrad Stern School of Business. Um, and the reason that I did not go to graduate school is because I remember running in to someone in the library when I was studying um, for winter finals and they had the same book that I had. And I'm like, so I, I'm not going through that again. And I ended up actually starting my first company, Mischief, while I was at NYU. Wow. And did you run into Herb? Ke Herb was such a good guy at MTV or Herb Keller. Um, oh, you mean Herb who ran Nickelodeon? Yeah, Nickelodeon. He's such a good guy to me. Herb is one of the great dudes ever. Um, ever. He was a, a, he's a, he's not dead, obviously, but he's a kind guy. He taught me a lot. He was on my um, side through every pitch I made. And when I said to Viacom, we really need to have 20% of the revenue of this company being in digital. And I remember making a pitch to them to buy IGN and to buy MySpace and to ultimately make an acquisition of the areas that we were weak in social networking, young males around gaming. I remember her distinctly after I made the pitch said, give him the jet and basically go give him the plane and let him go and get these companies. We got to get them and we got to, you know, sort of really court these new entrepreneurs. And um, to this day, he's a friend and, and uh, you know, really was an example of the great boss 
who was competitive and creative and business savvy, but also had a big heart. Big heart. I was like, how could someone in this business, after Quincy yelling at me every day, could there be a guy like Herb who's just so goddamn sweet? I was the luckiest guy to have gone through this. I was only in the business for like six months or a year. It was just like a whirlwind that I didn't, I just met so many interesting people. And then I was out of the media business, right? Back in the internet world. And uh, I don't miss it, but I got lucky, like meeting Herb and Marquez. And, and there are a bunch of these kinds of executives like Herb or even people like Barry Diller, where you'd think that they want to hobnob with the other moguls and all that kind of stuff. But ultimately what they really want to know is who's the next guy, who's the next Jack, you know, who's the next woman that's going to really innovate in the space. And they're very generous with their time. And I would say that the one trait that is common amongst all of them is voracious curiosity. And yes. all of them are the same with that. They just want to learn. And if they, they look at you, not as someone beneath them, they look at you as someone who's going to teach them. Yes. They're just sponges. And then it's just infectious. So, all right, I got to just go back still then. So how do you end up at MySpace? So it's, it's a strange story, but um, towards the end of my career at MTV, um, my partner at MTV is a guy named Nick Lehman. You know, I sort of was the head of the division and he was the COO, but really a, a lot of the stuff that we did together and Nick was really the executor. He came to my office one day and he said, like, listen, we have a show called uh, Laguna Beach. And the biggest traffic pocket of Laguna Beach talk on the internet is not on an MTV property. It's on something called MySpace. And uh, I had not heard of it. I didn't know what social networking was at the time. Um, I can't say that I was full into the, I was full on the internet in terms of distribution of media and our content and those experiences around music, but I wasn't really sold in on, on what would become the transition for where MTV needed to go. So Nick and I are sitting in the room and I said, you know, that's interesting. We should talk to these guys. And then I realized after looking at MySpace that MTV was going to have a reckoning and they were going to have to understand that they were no longer the tastemakers. They were trend magnifiers. They were going to have to become the platform that allowed the audience to tell each other what was cool, that there wasn't going to be this centralized cool factor anymore unless they just wanted to be a small brand. And Nick set up a meeting with um, Krista Wolf and Tom Anderson. I'll never forget it. They were living and working in, or at least Tom was living. I, I really like Tom. I like, I like both of them. Tom was, I think, living in the office because I remember he was like on Second Street off of Santa, like right in Santa Monica off the beach. And I walked into the office and I remember walking to his office and there was a cot on the floor, not even a cot, just a mattress on the floor. And, you know, when, when Sony came to buy my company many years ago, they thought they were going to an office building and they end up going into this apartment building on 96th Street I'm in sweatpants, unshaven, and there's like 10 computers all over my apartment. And I, I think they think they walked into the wrong room. And when I walked in, now having been a corporate executive, I guess, into Tom's room, I felt very much at home. And, you know, we were aggressive in the beginning. And then I think what happened, and lots of people have written books about this, uh, Julia Angwin and others, you know, once Viacom split and we sort of turned this over to Corp Dev, I don't think Viacom understood it was a seller's market. And ultimately, the deal took a year to get done, and we lost out to Rupert, who I eventually went to work for. And Rupert, you know, played for keeps. Rupert was knew what was the seller's market. He was willing to overpay, and he gave exploding offers. And uh, I, I basically quit within a couple of weeks of us losing that deal because I was so angry at the way Viacom had handled it. Well, I was probably a little childish, and I wasn't a deal guy at the time. Um, so I didn't really understand. I just sort of handed it over, but I was angry. Um, and I think one of the reactions to that after selling Slingbox, when Rupert called me and said, Hey, we're having some issues at MySpace. Would you like to come run it? Um, that was one of my, you know, I wouldn't say it was one of my better decisions, no disrespect to MySpace, but I try, I tend to like to build things, not fix them, um, or fix other people's issues. But there was a huge chip on my shoulder that we had missed it. And, um, you know, I, I tell the story often and no disrespect to World War II veterans, but I'm a big fan of history and a big fan of the movies around it and the valor and the, the bravery. But being at MySpace that first three weeks was like the opening of Saving Private Ryan when like the boats open on, on Normandy and you're just taking shrapnel um, because, <laughs> you, you're, you're, you know, you got Rupert you were calling shit you at the time. Show. I wasn't a political guy. So I, you know, I had known Rupert's family since I was in grade school and I grew up with one of the kids 
And it was, I was being courted by him and the press release was coming and all the wrong reasons to do something. And then I remember the line out the door the day uh, Owen Vanetta started as CEO. And then Mike Jones and I started as co-presidents. It was like the opening of jaws in 1977. Like you could see New Jersey at the end of the line and it was just complaints and people upset with stuff. And I remember shutting the door and shaking my head. Like I had just bought a new television during Christmas and just went to CES and saw that it was obsolete. So, you know, that was the first, that was the first week, but I will say I learned a lot being there and there were great people there and I still have those relationships, but uh, I guess my point was I made the decision for the wrong reasons. Wow. I sort of bring that up. Are we still friends? No, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sitting down. With I know it's such a great here. story. Yeah. You just, you've, Listen, you've as, just nailed as you, it. Yeah. As you get older, you know, you realize that even in failure, you learn a lot of stuff. You learn about, um, you know, catastrophe and how you get out of it. And, you know, an, analytics, things that I, you know, Mike Jones taught me a lot about data. Like, so, while it was rough during there and I was traveling between there and New York constantly, cause I also was running product for news corp at the same time. Um, you know, it was, it's a learning experience. I just, I think, I think what happens often, and I'm sure you understand this, like you have some successes, you love being in the mix so much, not just the social aspects of it, but really about building things and getting to consumers and helping artists and whatever it is. And I had decided after Slingbox cause it was really a war we were in with Slingbox that I needed some time off and I had moved down to Miami um, you know, planning to stay there for about a year. And I got a call three weeks in from Jim Citrin at Spencer Stewart saying Rupert wanted to meet you. And, you know, literally like that, it's like the, the angel and the devil on your shoulder, like an animal house, you know, yeah. the, the angel saying, stay put, you need the rest. And the, and the devil's like, dude, get back in the game, get back in the game. And I think I was young enough where like, I just listened to the devil a little too much and went back into the game for the wrong reasons. And um, at the end of the day, you have to love what you build. It wasn't a MySpace user. It wasn't a product development that I thought was, you know, top notch. You saw what was going on at Facebook. And I think for all the, um, you know, sort of shallow reasons, I took the job, even though I learned a lot. I liked the experience overall at the end of the day, looking back, um, you learned about yourself and we all, even through success, we have fallibilities. Well, I think it's important because, man, my mistakes, I learn a lot more than my successes. So that's a great story. I appreciate it. So Slingbox was bought by News Corp? I forgot to ask. So how did no, Slingbox No, no, no. Sorry, sorry. So, 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 so Slingbox was, Blake was very smart. So Blake in the, in the B round took in Liberty Media, who owned DirecTV at the time, and Echo Star, who owned Dish at the time. And his idea was Blake never, as much as he wanted to disrupt the MVPD or the cable operator market, he was just as happy to sell it to them and then go and innovate from the inside. And ultimately, when um, there was some consumer electronics companies had approached us uh, to buy or, uh, at some point, um, and then, you know, like Blake would do, he got a bidding war going and some of the B investors started to look at it as did Comcast and others. And we ended up with Charlie Ergen at Dish, um, who is one of the most unique entrepreneurs in the history of the world, if not the history of media. Um, you know, he is as brilliant as, as the day is long and in many ways is, is the most fiscally conscious CEO to the detriment of a company I've ever seen. He was the guy that signed, he signed every check over 20,000. And I remember that the, if you were at, if you at Dish and you wanted to have soup, um, you would get a free spoon. But if you wanted a spoon <laughs> and you weren't getting soup, it was like five cents or something. You know, he would have this sort of Southern all shucks draw type of thing, but the guy was a master poker player and one of the great strategists and risk takers in the history of the cable business. And that's, you know, putting up his name against John Malone and others. So we ended up there as that was the highest bid and we integrated the sling box into their units. And ultimately they became an innovator in sort of the, the everywhere space, but not personally, but business wise, Blake and Charlie clashed. I wanted to stay for a while because it was Hulu was coming up and Hulu was an idea that I was involved in at, at Viacom. And one of the, one of the, one of, at the time, one of the reasons I was leaving Viacom was I may wanted to have gone to what was called, or before that, before Clown Co., which they called Hulu, before George Klyakov, I, I may have wanted to go to Hulu. And uh, it was just a, it was, you know, it was a time where like, I think we battled over healthcare and Blake wanted better healthcare for the employees. And I remember, you know, there were just a couple of meetings where Blake just 
It was like, I can't do this anymore. And for me, that company was a family and I could never stay there without him. So when he decided to leave, you know, me and Jason Krikorian, his brother and our other friend and partner, Ben White left. Um, and I still am very affectionate towards Charlie. I run into him every year at CES and uh, I can't say they built the best products in the world, but they, they were the risk takers and the most innovative, you know, running internet through the wire line, putting in, you know, ad skipping into the boxes, putting in sling box into the boxes. He really did those things. And he used to say stuff like, I'm like, well, we can't do that, Charlie. He goes, son, innovation through litigation. Um, he just was a unique guy. <laughs> oh, my God. These stories. Okay. I'm sorry to make you go back because now. I no, not at all. Not at all. No, I mean, I'm thrilled uh, because yeah. I want to talk about the future, but uh, fuck that. The um, who best to talk about the future than getting everybody caught up on the past. So left alone for 24 hours with no work to do and you can't go outside. What would a day look like for you today with media? What would be the dream day? Yeah, yeah you got the right food, coffee. No one's going to bug you. Sun's shining. You're in a Brooklyn place or L.A. I'll tell you something funny. You know, I just got engaged in um, in August and I have a separate place in L.A. And I wanted to wait until we bought a house. But obviously house hunting during COVID was no fun. And at some point, you know, you got to pull the trigger at 49 and think, you know, it's not cool to sort of have your own place when you're engaged to somebody. So I recently moved into my fiance Liz's apartment with her two young boys. And, you know, it's, it's new to me because I've led a very selfish life and I'm a bit of a man child. So um, in a downstairs apartment, I built a man cave um, or just a cave. <laughs> of course um, you did. Thank and, God. And it's sort of what I call my prison cell if I had internet peloton and every access to every media and internet service in the world and I my knew dream, this is the right guy to ask this question keep going yeah. i mean my dream would be like let's say i go to jail but i can design my cell and i have one terabit internet i would just watch streaming media all day you know to get back to me into 350 shows and episodes like the way i curate is i'll hear something in a movie or you and i'll be having a conversation on a walk and then I, you know, or I see something in a movie and I hit Wikipedia and I start to deep dive into it. So, you know, obviously I'm reading a lot about China, a lot about AI, um, a lot about the way that they think 30 or 50 years down the road, some of it, you know, smoke screen, some of it real. So I watched a tremendous amount of documentaries on China off of Amazon Prime and, you know, then started to look at, you know, HSBC, the bank and learning about money laundering. And then I watched a video on Prime called Banksters. And I just go down rabbit holes. I go down rabbit holes on espionage, on narcos. You know, um, my college friend, Eric Newman, produced a show called Narcos on, on Netflix. So once I watch that, I start to go back and read the books or the audio or the, um, the, or the audio books I listen to or, or podcasts. And I go deep. So to me, basically having a barefoot dreams blanket on my lap, a pillow behind me, my feet up on an ottoman. I've got my little box of remotes. I've got my mobile phone so I can constantly look up things while I'm watching the video. And I know some level of, of high quality chicken fingers are very near me via Postmates or DoorDash. And my big, you know, 64 ounce bottle uh, or hydro, <laughs> hydro flask of water. You know, the only thing I would say that is missing from it, because I'm not in, because I'm in LA and not New York, is I would like to see some so snow falling on the ground. You know, the problem with living in Los Angeles, you know, in the streaming era is in New York, beautiful days are not a dime a dozen. So when it's when, you, when it's nice, you go out, you, you don't stay in. But but if you're in New York or living in L.A., it feels terrible to watch streaming media at two o'clock in the afternoon when it's bright and sunny out. COVID, when it first hit, to believe it or not, Howard, I secretly said to myself, Oh my fucking God, this is amazing. I'm going to be able to stay in and watch as much video as I can. And I'm not going to feel bad about it because nobody else could go out. So I'm not going to have any FOMO. And that ultimately led to the 350, um, you know, shows and movies that I watched on HBO max and curiosity stream and prime and Netflix. And, you know, because I give a lot of advice to the studios, I get all their movies day and date, my home and their television library. So I, I literally, you know, I'm not done with Netflix, but I'm almost there. Uh, just one question. Will you, will you marry me? Um, listen, if I swung that way, I would, you're very handsome, but you know, Liz, is no, we taken, don't have to, so. we don't have to cuddle. I just want to sure. live with you. 
because I don't want to do the work that you're doing. I just trust you implicitly around media. So I just want to sit next to you. I won't bug you. I may even leave the room to fart. That's how much I think I like you. Here's what, here's what I'll say. Like you're happy to come to the cave, but you can't talk during the show. You know, you can't take me out of my zone. Like we could have the debates afterwards and I'll give you an Ottoman and you could sit there and we'll get you an extra blankie. But, you know, we got to watch it. We can't stop it. We don't do interruption. I wouldn't talk. I'm saying I respect you enough that I would leave the room if I had gas because I know that it is your spot. Has Liz enjoy media as much as you? My wife luckily enjoys media, but then she'll do Love Island. and I got to do that. And it's like t- terror. I'll, I'll tell you. Daughter. So I got another crazy story for you. So I had heart surgery in 2015. It was pretty rough. Blake helped me through it. My parents were gone and I, at the time, wasn't speaking to my sister. So I wrote a lot about this and I, all of a sudden I was getting in, in, in the read after newsletters, I was writing very personal stuff about my journey, about what was happening. And I would get these just amazing emails. I got something like 15,000 emails from the audience. It took me four years to reply to each one. A lot of them came from women. And they would say, hey, listen, I know you need a friend or you're lonely. If you need someone to take care of you or have a meal with, let me know. And I never understood why they were. I looked at myself as sort of the guy on death row. And why were the these nice ladies sort of emailing me while I was in prison on death row? And um, sure enough, my my fiance worked for something called the Annenberg Foundation. And she was a huge fan of Redef. And she reached out to me and said, you know, I really like what you're writing. And I, I watch the shows you watch and I listen to the music you listen to. And I'd love to meet. She was very smart in that she knew that we had mutual friends. So she went through them and I completely pushed her off and almost didn't answer anything for two years. I was in a tough space after Blake passed away and was just getting back to health. And then one day I got a text saying, you know, Hey, why don't we just have lunch? Don't be afraid. You seem like a nice guy. And I texted her back and I said, listen, I'm not in LA right now, but when I get back, um, I'm happy to take you to lunch. And she goes, Oh really? Because do you own a black, you know, Jeep that's sort of souped up and has redef logos all over it. Because unless you have a fleet of them, you're lying to me. And sure enough, she had seen the car that I drive driving on sunset. And I said, yeah, I'm lying. And we ended up meeting for lunch and got hit it off. And ultimately we've been together ever since. And um, she is a media fanatic. She tends to like lighter stuff and comedies. You know, I, I love dystopian shit. You know, I like Westworld. I like, the Sopranos. I like things like that. But when Trump got into office and I don't want to get into politics, the real world got worse than the dystopian drama. So she's the one that taught me about Dave and Mr. In between and baskets and community and parks and recreation and things that I just wasn't watching or, or hadn't watched. And, you know, the toughest thing in our relationship now is when you're a single guy and you can stay up as long as you want, you, you don't have any other responsibilities. I can watch as much as I want. Liz has two boys. I'm back to work now. She's working. So it was always a negotiation as to what we're going to watch and when. And, you know, it's like cheating. And I, I would argue that probably 53% of all divorces in the United States are as a result of cheating on streaming. And, uh, <laughs> you know, th- that's, that's what I would say. So it's a wonderful, you know, we just watched the Biggie documentary on Netflix. It's great. It was fantastic. We watched I Care A Lot on Netflix, which I can't spoil the ending for the audience, but if it didn't end up that way, I may have jumped off my terrace. Um, it's a fantastic movie. Hang on, I saw that. Yeah, I loved it. Yeah, I can't recommend it enough. And if, if that's going to be the caliber of Netflix movies that are coming out, like I'd say, you know, wow, wow. Wow. One of the things I say about Netflix now, and also obviously the other st- services like HBO Max, is that, you know, we've exported American culture for decades. You know, entertainment is one of our biggest exports and pop culture is something that in many ways we've ruled on. And I love that Netflix really were the first people to really go um, gung ho and start to put dramas in, with subtitles from other countries on their front page. And certainly when COVID hit production in Los Angeles and Vancouver and other areas like North Carolina, Um, There was a drought of new programming and Netflix really went and licensed a lot of stuff or HBO did. And I would say at minimum 30% of my viewing time now is on non-English dramas and comedies. And it's, it's been, you know, you can't understand a culture when you're not reading or listening to or watching their stories. And I think it's been not only a noble thing that the streaming industry has done, but it's good business and it also opens up a whole new aperture of stars and storytelling to, to, to watch. And it's similar to what the director of Parasite said. You know, if you could put up with a couple of lines of text, a whole new world will be open to you. 
And I, I really admire that about the streaming companies. They did it from necessity, but I think guys like Ted Sarandos and Netflix did it. I also think for social reasons. Yeah, I just interviewed for the Federation. I made a donation, so I got to interview the creator of Fauda. And I'm like, wow. you know, if, yeah, don't, don't what a spoil cool it for dude me, I'm, the I'm struggles. Late, I'm late to Fauda. I'm late to Fauda, so don't spoil it for me, but we're starting it now. Yeah, you know, I, it's so funny, Fauda, because as, as a Jew, I just can't talk about it enough. It moved me. I mean, there's many of these shows I'm having. I go to Israel once a year, and I, you know, so... So I'm watching it, and I have friends in Israel, and yada, 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 and I just couldn't tell enough people about it. It's so funny, because my son's friends are not, you know, different. His friends are Jewish, or San Diego, and I was put on Fauda for him. I was so excited to get Fauda for him. And like, in the first 10 minutes, like, his friends, the non-Jewish friends, I can't tell the difference between the Jewish guys and the Arab guys. I go, yeah, welcome to the fucking Middle East. Like, that's the, that's the joke of it. I mean, I spent a month going from Israel to Beirut to Jordan to Egypt the cultures are similar. The food is similar. You know, they, they separate governments from people. Um, Middle East is some of the most fun I've ever had. The best trip, the best city I've ever been in is Beirut. That's the joke of it all. That's the joke of it all. I couldn't get them to, uh, you know, they're so removed, these poor kids, but they were so dead right because they don't understand the conflict. They go, wait a minute, I don't know who's on what. They couldn't, the language of this, it just didn't interest them because they couldn't understand the difference. And that yeah. was fascinating to me. It was a moving. Yeah, there's many documentaries you could watch with ex-Israeli intelligence officers basically saying, you know, in many ways, the way that both sides have handled it militarily is just a mistake because you need to understand why your enemy is your enemy and where those thoughts come from rather than the immediate threat as well. And uh, I, I hope a lot of those dramas start to, you know, sort of examine that. And again, that's why I'm not, they're dramas, they're comedies, they're not, some are based in reality, but they are not reality I guess, you know, Redef was always about curiosity and my mom would always ask me to ask why. And I would joke, you know, she regretted that towards the end of her life. But, um, you know, you look at these things and once you start to get a spark of interest, you can go down a rabbit hole and start to understand history and look at real players. And sometimes entertainment does that. It does spark that need for educating yourself. Phenomenal. I got to meet Liz. I'm, I'm going to demand that we hang out once, once COVID passes. In LA. Would you, that be you, okay? Hey, listen, it's it, it it would be not hard to come down to where you are. It's beautiful down there and it's it's an easy drive for me. And uh I know we jump in and meet meet each other at conferences and stuff, but you know, listen, I think what COVID has done for me, you know, I'm a schmoozer. I like to meet people and hear about new things and I'm impressed by what people have built. But at the end of the day, life is short. I've been through some health stuff and you want to be around people that you laugh with and you have fun with and that you could learn with. And you're one of those guys and we'll definitely hang and we'll get Marquez and, and the guys out as well. Do you like LA more than New York? You know, I have a friend, Jamie Patrick who gave me the greatest line because I've lived here three years and he goes, the key to a New Yorker living in LA is don't compare it to New York. It's just different. True. But do you like it more? Listen, this is where my love is. So there's no, there's no debating that, you know, I found happiness in LA and that's wonderful. You know, do I think that the egg sandwiches have caught up to New York yet? No. Um, is there the is there is there the immediacy of New York? No. But I've got mountains and I've got skiing and I've got plane rides to Vegas or Colorado. And, you know, it's I'm in the hub of a creative industry that I love. It's slower than I'm used to, but so am I. <laughs> I'm slower than I used to be. Um, but it's also it's, it's what's interesting about Los Angeles now which I never felt in New York because it was always the metropolis is like, you can feel LA is on the come. You know, they, you know, Snapchat's IPO has helped build a, a group of entrepreneurs out here who are starting other businesses. You have investors like um, Mark Suster or Dana Settle or, um, you know, the Wonder Co guys are all these different people that are building new things. It's a real town that you don't have to be living in Hollywood or Beverly Hills, you know, to have your own thing going. There's all these different borough-like areas that have their own food. It's becoming a foodie town. It's becoming an art town. It's always been a music town. And it's interesting, you know, I'm, I'm not like these guys who moved to Miami now and think that they just landed on Plymouth Rock and they're about to settle it. You know, Miami's been around since Jesus wore <laughs> short pants. But L.A. for me, it's interesting to, for me to watch it turning into even more of a city where it was a little bit of a big, sleepy town. And every area has its own personality from Pasadena to, you know, Silver Lake and on. And, um, and it's nice to learn. You know, I don't, I always get confused in, in between mountains and canyons. So 
I'm still learning the city, even though I've lived here three times, but I would say the food, the art, all that stuff is coming. And listen, I love movies and I still like to go to movie theaters and soon we're going to be able to go back. And, you know, I used to play hooky on Friday with my friends, Jason Rapp and Greg Clayman and Rob Goldberg. And we would, we would just go out and see, you know, a movie or two a week. And you feel that here in Los Angeles, it's still a big deal. So it's just different. And I don't want to compare them like any other city. Every city has its own personality. Who have you been stage struck meeting? Cause you've met everybody or starstruck. Um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, I met so many people at MTV, you know, and I'm not someone who is shy. I remember, I think Bill Gates was going to like literally fall over because I was talking so much while he was eating his two hamburgers. I think in my career, <laughs> I was, I, I'm always, I'm always a little nervous before I meet someone that I'm, I'm really interested in. And I think the two people I would say would be Steve Jobs and Bono. Jobs I met back when I was at MTV and we had wanted to start a music service and iTunes had just launched. And I just didn't think that Viacom had the stomach for this and they had a relationship with jobs. And I said, well, why don't we become part of the arm of iTunes and do programming? And Jimmy Iovine, you know, the famous music executive who was a friend. Oh, of MTV, I love that. That guy is yeah, so, just legendary. So Iovine set up a meeting for us with jobs at Pixar and me, Tom Freston, Jimmy Iovine is sort of the emissary and Van Toffler who ran MTV went to meet jobs. And I'm literally, I have had every Mac since it came out, you know, whether it was Steve Ross or Steve jobs, these were heroes. And I remember waiting for him in Pixar and they gave us the smart water bottles because he liked the design of those bottles and that's what he drank. And I was super nervous, but never when I go on stage or I start a meeting, am I nervous? So immediately I'm going from this kid who's about to see his hero to telling Steve Jobs how the music business is going to play out. And I said that it's going to be all about subscription. This is like very early on in the 2000s. And he hears me out and he smiles and he looks at me and he says, Jason, you seem like a good guy, but all your ideas are wrong. And the room erupted in laughter. And I remember when we were leaving to go to Google to talk to them next, Preston turned to me and he goes, hey, Jay, don't talk in the next meeting. Um, and we're just <laughs> cracking it up. And I remember later, Courtney Holt, who's at, who's at um, MySpace now and was one of, you know, Jimmy's right hand guys in the digital world and sort of many ways taught Jimmy a lot about the digital world, said um, with Steve, Steve never admitted to anything. He didn't admit about video when it came to the iPod. He said who would watch video on an iPod and didn't want to admit about subscription while they were working on it. The other story was really my hero in music, Bono, um, where I had left MySpace and I was taking some time off and I had become friendly through Tom Freston with their manager at the time, Paul McGinnis. And Bono had fallen off a bike or something. It hurt him and, and the tour had stopped and he was just about to go back on tour. And Paul said, Hey, if you're interested, we're, we're our opening date is in, um, in Spain. And um, you know, why don't you meet us? And uh, and I said, wow. And it just so happens that I don't know if you know, Brooke Hammerling, who's a successful communications executive who has largely been around the digital space. She was friends with the band as well. And I said, why don't we go together? And we, we went to the South of France. I'll never forget. We we're having dinner with wow. Paul, Paul McGinnis, who's the, the, just one of the great heroes of the music business and wonderful guy. And all of a sudden we're sitting on the beach, you know, having this dinner and I get tapped on the shoulder by Bono and the edge and they introduced themselves and then we went, um, we flew with them to Spain the next day to watch their concert. It was a true story. And I'm just like literally in awe. You know, I'm not like, you know, I'm not like a, a crazy. I'm just like, you know, I'm cool and calm. But like these guys meant a lot to me growing up. And they were the ascension of MTV and, um, and really good people. Like all of them are good people. And we were, we're in um, San Sebastian, Spain. They're playing to 80,000 people. Two songs are left. And their assistant come and gets Brooke and I, and sure enough, they put us behind the drum riser for the last two songs. So we could watch what it's like to stand on stage and look at the 80,000 people. And then we rode in a motorcade back to their plane and flew back to France. And then they asked me to come and sit up with the band in the first cabin. And I had not really spent any time with Bono yet. And Bono sits down like one o'clock in the morning for dinner with me and says, so Jason, my space failed because it wasn't an engineering led organization. Right. And I'm like, Holy fuck. 
Like, I, I literally can't believe that I'm having this conversation, but let alone, like, he sort of nailed it. And, uh, and that was the time that I, that I met Bono, and it was a great conversation about everything. And I got to meet him again, just to show you what a man she is. When Judy McGrath left MTV, you know, the, the legendary executive and my mentor, you know, that was her whole career, and she was sad. And uh, a friend of Judy's and mine called Paul McGinnis and said, she's a little down. He goes, well, we're opening up in Mexico City tomorrow. Why don't you guys come down? And sure enough, we, we got on a plane, and we met them at the hotel, and we were in their party for the whole week there. They gave shout-outs from the stage. They threw a dinner for her. And I remember that night, it was Bono's birthday. And I just remember talking to him about the movie, Waiting for Superman, about the education system. But he kept interrupting and getting up because every five seconds, a new, or every five minutes, a new song would come on from Joy Division or The Clash. And he would just get up and go and kiss the DJ because he loved the song so much. And, you know, it sounds like name dropping, but, you know, there are just those people that no matter how old you get, no matter how jaded you get, no matter how rich you get or, or successful or healthy, that you just are proud to meet. And when they turn out to be decent people and not dicks, it's even that much better. And the guys from you two are good people. And Bono is just a unique dude. Wow. All right. I, I got to end there. Cause that's a mic drop. You've had like six mic drops. This is like unbelievable. So thanks for taking the time, man. Well, by the way, I, I want to do this again. You know, this is just a starter. Yeah. My bar mitzvah speech was 45 minutes. So I could do th three minutes or three hours with you. Yeah, but that was phenomenal. Well, how come you, I know Redef, Redef, how often are you doing it? Because it's so dense. Like I, I find myself always behind. Yeah, so I, I have multiple verticals. One is music. I do media. Yeah. I took the last year off because I have always used, you know, work as an excuse. And I really wanted my relationship to work. So I was fortunate enough to take the year off. I'm sort of glad I took the COVID year off because I didn't want to really write about politics and what was going on. But I come back in April and that's why you haven't seen it in your box. And it's called Media Redef and you can get it at redef.com or go onto Twitter and find me. And, um, you know, we've got some new things going on and our rants and raves, which are takes on that things every day. And then the 20 stories we pick for you to read. And remember, it's, it's not about a newsletter about what happened or, you know, it's about what it means. So if you're a couple of days behind, you can always pick it up and, and use it as an archive and, and still learn stuff. I think it was smart that you took a year off. I have to say, like, I know because we were the same way, like we just were bitching and we don't really mean to bitch, but we felt disgusted by what was going on. But I feel like Bob could have taken a year off left sets like he was just. He was just opening himself up to such aggravation. And I enjoyed reading our friends, him. Yeah, our, our friend Bob can compartmentalize, and he's a machine when he writes. I found it. It was it, the topics were new to me, and frankly, I'm what I call a Frank Capra American. You know, I believed in the American dream and those movies, like Mr. Smith goes to Washington, and you know, maybe saw the the world through a different lens. And some of it I was wrong about, and. At some point, I was ranting on Twitter. I was as angry as can be. And at the end of the day, it was hurting me more than anybody else. And right, I didn't want right. an excuse, you know, for the first time to have the right relationship and wanting to get married and being fortunate enough to say, hey, I just need a, a pause right now and having investors that were okay with that. And, um, you know, I, I did the right thing. And ultimately, I think you're going to see more positivity, more about what can happen versus nasty, nasty, you know, stuff that was going on and, I think I'm better for it. And, you know, I obviously not many people are fortunate enough to do that. Um, or, you know, sometimes you need to put your head in the sand so that it doesn't corrupt you And social media in 280 characters or small posts and likely being able to find the stuff that you already agree with rather than debate healthy is a real schism in our culture. And it was taking me down personally. And I want to get back to sort of the happy fun side. I'm still right. a critic. I still got my ornery New York thing in there. But I, you know, without the ulcers, better. It's just nicer now. I just feel like a weight's been lifted off me. I wrote through it, and I was just so mad at myself for getting dragged into things that I didn't really care about. But uh, I think that was a good decision. You know, I, I can't say it on Twitter, but like I, internally, like you, I was like, oh, can't wait for COVID-21. Not because, of course, the, the I just loved being alone with the family, by yeah. myself. Um we give a lot of shit to the platforms and they could do better. But at the end of the day, remember those are people on platforms and there's a lot of angry people out there for justified reasons. There's a lot of angry people there for the wrong reasons. 
And there's a lot of people there who are vicious and anonymous and are cowards and don't want to show their faces. And while we need the help of moderation and other ways to improve the discourse, it's not the platform that's writing that stuff. They're human beings. Yeah. And uh, that's the sad and the good part of it. Yeah. All right. Well, this has been too long. I've kept you, but uh, to, so I just learned a ton. Next time, we're going to just talk about the future and media. Because, I mean, I love media. I could just, there's just such good media and document. It's just such a great time to be a creator. And we didn't get into that. But I, I'm doing my own documentary I contributed towards. I, I just feel so creative and it's never been a better time to be creative. I wish I was younger, but let's schedule you know. it now. The creator economy, if you thought it exploded years ago with YouTube is about to explode. And I think it's going to be more equitable, you know, obviously the streaming services and the consolidation in there, the newsletter business, there's so much to talk about. And, you know, if I don't talk about it with you, I'll go stand on the corner of Wilshire and Beverly Glenn and do it. So, you know, let's get it scheduled. I'll get it scheduled. You're the man. I'm so glad you're, you're, you're healthy. I didn't know these stories. So I'm just so thrilled to get them and, uh, redef everybody. I'll, I'll share it all in the, uh, in the notes. And, uh, we, I promise I'll bug you and, uh, I appreciate you taking time. My man, be well. Thanks for having me. I love you, pal. Be good. See you, buddy. Canute. Yeah. He's an interesting guy. I want him back on. He's a legend. Yeah. So I just read it. It's so dense, right? Because I'm a media freak. I know people think I like the markets, but <laughs> I like media more. And, you know, people like that inspired me to start my show and keep my blog going. And then if he, like, you know, a lot of people say, hey, I like what you write. And then, But it's when people like uh, Jason have, have yelled out, hey, man, I like your stuff or introduce him to somebody when we meet. Mm -hmm. Not that I want to be a celebrity, but it's nice to know other artists uh, like your stuff. And he's seen stuff. That Bono story, oh, huh? That is a great story. Have you heard of U2 in Norway? Do they have U2 in Norway? <laughs> <laughs> so oh, my funny, God. Sling I mean, I God. Could, you would have been his best buddy with Slingbox. That yeah, is no so kidding, committed. right? Yeah, oh, yeah. You are the MacGyver of Norway. Well, thank you. I take that as a compliment. It is a compliment. And you're better looking and taller. All right, everybody, panic with friends. Oh, man, I'd like to be friends with Jason. So we're going to get him back. It's fun not to talk about investing. I agree. But that won't happen that often. And luckily, if it does happen, it happens with a legend like that. Exactly. What stories? What stories that were? This is Panic with Friends. Uh, you can follow us on uh, Spotify or Apple Podcasts, Google. Search my name. It's easy to find me. Subscribe once a week. You get a notification. You get people like Jason try and uh, skadoodle my way in with these smart people and have them tell stories and how to stay in front of the markets a little bit, not too far ahead. Uh, thanks, Canute, uh, for uh, being patient and putting this together, and we'll see everybody on the next episode. Howard Lindzen is the founder and general partner at Social Leverage. All opinions expressed by Howard and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of social leverage or stock twits. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for decisions. Guests may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast. A bike or something had heard him and the tour had stopped and he was just about to go back on tour. And Paul said, hey, if you're interested, we're, we're, our opening date is in... Um, in Spain. And, um, you know, why don't you meet us? And, uh, and I said, wow. And it just so happens that I don't know if you know, Brooke Hammerling, who's a successful communications executive who has largely been around the digital space. She was friends with the band as well. And I said, why don't we go together? And we, we went to the South of France. I'll never forget. We were having dinner with wow. Paul, Paul McGinnis, who's the, the, just one of the great heroes of the music business and wonderful guy. And all of a sudden, we're sitting on the beach, you know, having this dinner and I get tapped on the shoulder by Bono and the edge and they introduced themselves. And then we went, um, we flew with them to Spain the next day to watch their concert. This is a true story. And I'm just like literally in awe, you know, I'm not like, you know, I'm not like a, a crazy, I'm just like, you know, I'm cool and calm, but like these guys meant a lot to me growing up and they were the ascension of MTV and, um, and really good people. Like all of them are good people. And we were, we're in um, San Sebastian, Spain. They're playing to 80,000 people. Two songs are left and their assistant come and gets Brooke and I. And sure enough, they put us 
behind the drum riser for the last two songs. So we could watch what it's like to stand on stage and look at the 80,000 people. And then we rode in a motorcade back to their plane and flew back to France. And then they asked me to come and sit up with the band in the first cabin. And I had not really spent any time with Bono yet. And Bono sits down at one o'clock in the morning for dinner with me and says, so Jason, my space failed because it wasn't an engineering led organization. Right. And I'm like, Holy fuck. Like I, I literally can't believe that I'm having this conversation, but let alone like he sort of nailed it. And, uh, and that was the time that I, that I met Bono and it was a great conversation about everything. And I got to meet him again, just to show you what a man she is. When Judy McGrath left MTV, you know, the, the legendary executive and my mentor, you know, that was her whole career and she was sad. And uh, a friend of Judy's and mine called Paul McGinnis and said, she's a little down. He goes, well, we're opening up in Mexico city tomorrow. Why don't you guys come down? And sure enough, we, we got on a plane and we met them at the hotel and we were in their party for the whole week there. They gave shout outs from the stage. They threw a dinner for her. And I remember that night, it was Bono's birthday. And I just remember talking to him about the movie, waiting for Superman about the education system, but he kept interrupting and getting up because every five seconds, a new or every five minutes, a new song would come on from joy division or the clash. And he would just get up and go and kiss the DJ. Cause he loved the song so much. And, you know, it sounds like name dropping, but, you know, there are just those people that no matter how old you get, no matter how jaded you get, no matter how rich you get or, or successful or healthy, that you just are proud to meet. And when they turn out to be decent people and not dicks, it's even that much better. And the guys from U2 are good people. And Bono is just a unique dude. Wow. All right. I, I got to end there because that's a mic drop. You've had like six mic drops. This is like unbelievable. So thanks for taking the time, man. Well, by the way, I, I want to do this again. You know, this is just a starter. Yeah. My bar mitzvah speech was 45 minutes. So I could do th three minutes or three hours with you. Yeah, but that was phenomenal. Well, how come you, I know we get, we def, and how often are you doing it? Because it's so dense. Like I, I find myself always behind. Yeah. So I, I have multiple verticals. One is music. I do media. Yeah. I took the last year off because I have always used, you know, work as an excuse. And I really wanted my relationship to work. So I was fortunate enough to take the year off. I'm sort of glad I took the COVID year off because I didn't want to really write about politics and what was going on. But I come back in April and that's why you haven't seen it in your box. And it's called Media Redef and you can get it at redef.com or go onto Twitter and find me. And, um, you know, we've got some new things going on and our rants and raves, which are takes on things every day. And then the 20 stories we pick for you to read. And remember, it's, it's not about a newsletter about what happened or, you know, it's about what it means. So if you're a couple of days behind, you can always pick it up and, and use it as an archive and, and still learn stuff. I think it was smart that you took a year off. I have to say, like, I know because we were the same way, like we just were bitching and we don't really mean to bitch, but we felt disgusted by what was going on. But I feel like Bob could have taken a year off left sets like he was just. He was just opening himself up to such aggravation. And I enjoyed reading our friends, his. Yeah, our, our friend Bob can compartmentalize and he's a machine when he writes. I found it, it was, it, the topics were new to me. And frankly, I'm what I call a Frank Capra American. You know, I believed in the American dream and those movies like Mr. Smith goes to Washington and, you know, maybe saw the, the world through a different lens. And some of it I was wrong about. And at some point I was ranting on Twitter. I was as angry as can be. And at the end of the day, it was hurting me more than anybody else. And right, I didn't want right. an excuse, you know, for the first time to have the right relationship and wanting to get married and being fortunate enough to say, Hey, I just need a, a pause right now and having investors that were okay with that. And, um, you know, I, I did the right thing. And ultimately I think you're going to see more positivity, more about what can happen versus nasty, nasty, you know, stuff that was going on. And, I think I'm better for it. And, you know, I obviously not many people are fortunate enough to do that. Um, or, you know, sometimes you need to put your head in the sand so that it doesn't corrupt you And social media in 280 characters or small posts and likely being able to find the stuff that you already agree with rather than debate healthy is a real schism in our culture. And it was taking me down personally. And I want to get back to sort of the happy fun side. You still right. a critic. I still got my ornery New York thing in there. But I, you know, without the ulcers, better. It's just nicer now. I just feel like a weight's been lifted off me. I wrote through it, and I was just 
so mad at myself for getting dragged into things that I didn't really care about. But uh, I think that was a good decision. You know, I, I can't say it on Twitter, but like I, internally, like you, I was like, oh, can't wait for COVID-21. Not because, of course, the, the I just loved being alone with the family, by yeah. myself. Um, we give a lot of shit to the platforms and they could do better. But at the end of the day, remember, those are people on platforms. And there's a lot of angry people out there for justified reasons. There's a lot of angry people there for the wrong reasons. And there's a lot of people there who are vicious and anonymous and are cowards and don't want to show their faces. And while we need the help of moderation and other ways to improve the discourse, it's not the platform that's writing that stuff. They're human beings. Yeah. And uh, that's the sad and the good part of it. Yeah. All right. Well, this has been too long. I've kept you, but uh, so I just learned a ton. Next time we're going to just talk about the future and media. Cool. Cause I mean, I love media. I could just, there's just such good media and document. It's just such a great time to be a creator. And we didn't get into that, but I I'm doing my own documentary. I contributed towards, I, I just feel so creative and it's never been a better time to be creative. I wish I was younger, but let's schedule you know. it now. The creator economy, if you thought it exploded years ago with YouTube is about to explode. And I think it's going to be more equitable, you know, obviously the streaming services and the consolidation in there, the newsletter business, there's so much to talk about. And you know, if I don't talk about it with you, I'll go stand on the corner of Wilshire and Beverly Glen and do it. So, you know, let's get it scheduled. I'll get it scheduled. You're the man. I'm so glad you're, you're, you're healthy. I didn't know these stories. So I'm just so thrilled to get them and, uh, redef everybody. I'll, I'll share it all in the, uh, in the notes. And, uh, we, I promise I'll bug you and, uh, I appreciate you taking the time. My man, be well. Thanks for having me. I love you, pal. Be good. See you, buddy. Canute. Yeah. He's an interesting guy. I want him back on. He's a legend. Yeah. So I just read it. It's so dense, right? Because I'm a media freak. I know people think I like the markets, but <laughs> I like media more. And, you know, people like that inspired me to start my show and keep my blog going. And then if he, like, you know, a lot of people say, hey, I like what you write. And then, But it's when people like uh, Jason have, have yelled out, hey, man, I like your stuff or introduce him to somebody when we meet. Mm -hmm. Not that I want to be a celebrity, but it's nice to know other artists uh, like your stuff. And he's seen stuff. That Bono story, oh, yeah. huh? That is a great story. Have you heard of U2 in Norway? Do they have U2 in Norway? <laughs> <laughs> so oh, my funny, God. Sling I mean, I God. Could, you would have been his best buddy with Slingbox. That yeah, is no so kidding, committed. right? Yeah, oh, yeah. You are the MacGyver of Norway. Well, thank you. I take that as a compliment. It is a compliment. And you're better looking and taller. All right, everybody, panic with friends. Oh, man, I'd like to be friends with Jason. So we're going to get him back. It's fun not to talk about investing. I agree. But that won't happen that often. And luckily, if it does happen, it happens with a legend like that. Exactly. What stories? What stories that were? This is Panic with Friends. Uh, you can follow us on uh, Spotify or Apple Podcasts, Google, search my name. It's easy to find me. Subscribe once a week. You get a notification. You get people like Jason try and uh, skadoodle my way in with these smart people and have them tell stories and how to stay in front of the markets a little bit, not too far ahead. Uh, thanks, Canute, uh, for uh, being patient and putting this together, and we'll see everybody on the next episode. Howard Lindzen is the founder and general partner at Social Leverage. All opinions expressed by Howard and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Social Leverage or StockTwits. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for decisions. Guests may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast. And then if he, like, you know, a lot of people say, hey, I like what you write, and then, but it's when people like uh, Jason have, have yelled out, hey, man, I like your stuff, or introduce him to somebody when we meet. Mm -hmm. Not that I want to be a celebrity, but it's nice to know other artists uh, like your stuff. And he's seen stuff. That Bono story, oh, yeah. huh? That is a great story. Have you heard of U2 in Norway? Do they have U2 in Norway? <laughs> <laughs> so oh, my funny, God. Man. Sling. I mean, I could, you would have been his best buddy with Slingbox. Yeah, that is no so kidding, committed. right? Yeah, oh, yeah. You are the MacGyver of Norway. Well, thank you. I take that as a compliment. It is a compliment, and you're better looking and taller. All right, everybody, panic with friends. Oh, man, I'd like to be friends with Jason. So we're going to get him back. It's fun not to talk about investing. I agree. But 
that won't happen that often. And luckily, if it does happen, it happens with a legend like that. Exactly. What stories? What stories that were? This is Panic with Friends. Uh, you can follow us on uh, Spotify or Apple Podcasts, Google. Search my name. It's easy to find me. Subscribe once a week. You get a notification. You get people like Jason try and uh, skadoodle my way in with these smart people and have them tell stories and how to stay in front of the markets a little bit, not too far ahead. Uh, thanks, Canute, uh, for uh, being patient and putting this together, and we'll see everybody on the next episode. Howard Lindzen is the founder and general partner at Social Leverage. All opinions expressed by Howard and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Social Leverage or StockTwits. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for decisions. Guests may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast. Or stock twits. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for decisions. Guests may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast. Asked.